All right, buckle up, everybody, because today we are taking a deep dive into some uh, pretty complex math. Yeah. We're going to be looking at a brand new research paper. It was just published a few days ago on February 26, 2025, to be exact. Hot off the press. Exactly. And the title is a mouthful. It's called Volume Estimates for Unions of Convex Sets at the Kakea Set Conjecture in Three Dimensions. Catchy. Yeah, super catchy, right? But don't worry if you don't have a PhD in math because we've got expert speaker here to help us break down all those crazy formulas and proofs. Happy to help. So before we get lost in all the technical stuff, maybe we can just like set the stage a little bit. Um, have you ever heard of the Kakea set conjecture? Oh yeah, it's a classic problem. It's been puzzling mathematicians for ages. Basically, it asks about the smallest possible volume you can fit a bunch of needles into if those needles can rotate a full 360 degrees. Oh, okay. So it's not just about fitting them in like one position. It's about finding a space where they can spin around freely. Exactly. You got to think of it like trying to fit a bunch of straws into a tiny box, but the straws have to be able to rotate without poking out. Okay. That's a pretty cool visual. I can see how that would get tricky pretty quickly. So this whole thing about rotating needles, it sounds kind of simple, but I guess it leads to some pretty mind-bending math. Oh, absolutely. The Kakea conjecture is surprisingly deep. It turns out to be connected to all sorts of things like high-dimensional geometry and even signal processing. Wait a minute, signal processing, like what my phone uses? Yeah, exactly. It might seem strange, but there's a connection. It all comes down to how information is represented and transformed. A signal is like a wave, right? It has peaks and troughs. And the Kakea problem, in a way, relates to how efficiently you can pack information into those waves. Wow, okay, my brain's starting to hurt a little bit already. But let's get back to this new research paper. We were saying that it claims to have actually proven the Kakea conjecture in three dimensions, right? Yes, that's the big news. So how did they pull it off? They took a totally new approach. They decided to focus on how these needles, which they model as mathematical tubes, are clustered or non-clustered within a space. So instead of looking at each individual straw, they're like looking at the overall arrangement, like whether they're clumped together or spread out. That's a great way to put it. And to describe this clustering, they use a measure called CKTCW, which stands for Cat's Tau Convex Wolf Axioms. Wow, that's a mouthful of initiatives. I know, right? It's based on some groundbreaking work by the mathematicians Nets Katz and Terence Tau. They made some major progress on the Kakea conjecture a few years back. And the CKTCW measure essentially allows mathematicians to analyze sets of tubes where you can't pack too many of them into a single convex shape. So if I'm picturing a bunch of straws in a box, CKTCW tells me tightly I can pack them together without going over a certain limit. You got it. And that's a key part of their breakthrough. They were able to prove that if you have a set of tubes where this non-clustering property holds, then the volume of the space they occupy has to be almost as big as be. Hold on a sec. If they're not clustered together, wouldn't they actually take up more space? That's what our intuition might tell us. Yeah, but this conjecture says that even with some level of clustering, there's still a minimum amount of space these tubes have to occupy. It's like there's this invisible force pushing them apart no matter how cleverly you try to arrange them. Okay, that's pretty wild. So how do they actually prove that? Well, they use a very elegant method called multi-scale analysis. Imagine you're looking at a forest from a plane. At first, you just see the overall shape, but you don't see the individual trees, right? Right. Then you zoom in closer and you start to see how the branches are arranged. And if you zoom in even further, you see the individual leaves. So they're basically looking at this problem at different levels of zoom. That's it. They analyze how those tubes are clustered together at each level from tiny tubes to bigger ones. And the key is connecting the behavior they see at these different scales to build a complete picture. All right. I think I'm starting to get a vague idea of what they're doing, but I got to admit, I'm still feeling a little lost in the mathematical woods here. No worries. It's definitely complex stuff. But remember how we were talking about that CKT CW measure and how it tells us how clumped those tubes are? Well, the researchers discovered Something really interesting. Even though they're focusing on sets of tubes that are non-clustering, they found a similar kind of pattern repeating at different scales. You mean even when the tubes are spread out, there's still some sort of underlying structure? Exactly. They call it multi-scale self-similarity. It's kind of like those fractal images, you know, where you zoom in and you keep seeing the same basic shapes repeating just at smaller and smaller sizes. Oh, yeah, I've seen those. Those are pretty tricky. So it's not just about whether the tubes are clustered together. It's about how that clustering or lack of it repeats at different scales. You're getting it. And this self-similarity is a key ingredient in their proof. It helps them connect what's happening at the microscopic level with what's happening at the macro microscopic level. It bridges the gap in our understanding. Wow, this is all super fascinating. But I have to be honest, it's also incredibly complex. How on earth do they even start to grapple with all these different scales and patterns? Well, that's where their ingenuity really shines. They introduce a whole bunch of groundbreaking techniques to tackle the problem. One of the most important ones is something called a grains decomposition. 
grains, like grains of sand. You can think of it that way. They divide the space up into these tiny grains, kind of like pixels on a screen. This allows them to analyze how the tubes intersect interact within these tiny regions. So they're basically breaking the problem down into smaller, more manageable trunks. Exactly. But it doesn't stop there. They go on to develop three specific moves for manipulating these grains, essentially rearranging the puzzle pieces to reveal the underlying structure. So it's like they're playing a game with these little building blocks, moving them around to see how they fit together. It's a bit more abstract than that, but yeah, the idea is similar. They have moves for splitting grains, merging them, and even shifting them around. And these moves are designed to preserve the key properties of the decomposition, while also giving them more control over how they analyze the arrangement of tubes. Okay, it sounds like they've created a whole new set of tools to tackle this problem. Absolutely, and these tools are crucial for what they call their inductive argument, which is the backbone of their proof. Basically, they start by proving the conjecture for a really simple case, kind of like a base level. Okay. Then using these tools and this concept of self-similarity, they show how to climb up from that base case to more and more complex scenarios until they've proven the conjecture for the full-blown problem. So they're building a ladder rung by rung and using those moves to reach higher and higher levels of complexity. That's a perfect way to put it and those rungs are what they call assertions d and e in the paper they're like checkpoints along the way establishing key relationships between the volume of the tubes they're clustering and the different scales they're analyzing okay so we've got this non-clustering property multi-scale analysis grains decomposition strategic moves and assertions d and e my head is spinning is there anything else i need to know to even wrap my mind around this proof well there's one more crucial piece Remember how we talked about the tubes needing to be spread out enough for their analysis to work? Well, they capture that with a condition they call broadness. Broadness. So, like, the tubes have to have a certain width. It's not so much about their actual width as it is about how they're distributed in space. Imagine you're throwing darts at a dartboard. If you keep hitting the same spot over and over, that's not very broad. But if you hit different spots all over the board, that's considered broad. So the tubes have to be scattered around, not all bunched up in one little area. Exactly. And this broadness condition is super important for their analysis. It ensures there's enough wiggle room to apply the grains decomposition and those strategic moves effectively. If things get too tangled up, it becomes almost impossible to analyze. So it's like they need enough space to maneuver those puzzle pieces and see how they all fit together. Precisely. They need enough clustering to make the problem interesting, but not so much that it becomes intractable. Right. I think I'm starting to see the big picture here, but I have a feeling we've only just scratched the surface of this paper. There's still so much more to unpack, like those mysterious assertions, D&E, and... This whole concept of tube doubling that you mentioned earlier. Oh, you're absolutely right. We've only just begun to climb up this mathematical mountain. Well, then maybe it's time to take a deep breath and tackle those assertions next. This is where the real fun begins. I couldn't agree more. Buckle up. It's about to get really interesting. Remember how we were talking about that multi-scale approach? How the authors analyze the problem at different zoom levels? Yeah, like looking at the forest and trees and the leaves. Exactly. Well, assertions D and E are all about connecting those different levels. Okay, those assertions are still kind of mysterious to me. I get that they're important for the proof, but how do they actually work? Think of it like building a bridge. We're trying to connect what we know about the problem at a really small scale to the bigger picture. Like building a bridge between those tiny grains and the total volume of all the tubes. You got it. Assertion D basically gives us a way to estimate the total volume based on how the tubes are clustered together inside each of those little grains. So it's like taking a bunch of little measurements and using them to figure out the size of the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. But here's where it gets really interesting. Assertion E zooms in even further and focuses on a specific type of tube called a row tube. Hold on a sec, a row tube, what is that? It's basically a smaller tube that they use to analyze the problem at an even finer scale. It's like we're taking a magnifying glass to those grains and seeing how the tubes are arranged inside them. So we're going down another level looking at even tinier clusters within those grains. Exactly, and what Assertion E tells us is how the volume of the tubes inside a row tube relates to their clustering at that smaller scale. Okay, I think I'm starting to see how these assertions work together. Assertion D gives us the big picture and Assertion E zooms in on the details. But how do they actually prove anything? Here's the brilliant part. They manage to prove that assertions D and E are actually equivalent. Wait, what does that mean? It means if one of them is true, then the other one has to be true too. They're like two sides of the same coin. Oh, okay. So it's like having two different maps of the same territory. Exactly. And that gives them this incredibly powerful tool that can switch back and forth between these two perspectives using whichever one is most convenient at each step of the proof. Clever. So that's how they use those assertions to build their inductive argument, that ladder you were talking about. Precisely. Let's say we've proven the conjecture for 
tubes of a certain size. That's our starting rung on the ladder. Okay. Now we want to prove it for tubes that are a little bit bigger the next roll up. So we're assuming it's true for the smaller tubes and trying to show it's also true for slightly bigger ones. Right. We can use assertion D to estimate the overall volume of these bigger tubes. Okay, so assertion D gives us the big picture view. Right, but to make that estimate really accurate, we need to understand how the tubes are arranged within each of those little row tubes. Remember, that's where assertion E comes in handy. It lets us zoom in and analyze the volume inside those tiny regions. So we use assertion E to refine the estimate we got from assertion D. You got it. By combining those two perspectives, they can show that the conjecture, which we assumed was true for the smaller tubes, also holds for these slightly bigger tubes. And they just keep repeating this process, scaling up step by step, until they've proven it for the original tubes we were interested in. Wow, so it's like they're building the proof piece by piece, and those assertions are the glue that holds it all together. It's a really impressive feat of mathematical engineering, but remember those moves we talked about earlier, the ones for manipulating the grains? Those play a crucial role in all of this, too. Yeah, those moves are how they rearrange the pieces to get a clearer view. But I'm still a little fuzzing on how those moves work with assertions D and E. It's all about creating the right conditions for those assertions to actually work. Remember that broadness condition. Yeah, the tubes need to be spread out enough. Right. Well, sometimes even if the tubes meet that condition overall, they might be too bunched up within certain grains. So those grains might be too clumpy, even if the overall arrangement is spread out. That's exactly right. And that's where those moves come in handy. They let the researchers rearrange the grains, splitting them, merging them, or even just shifting them around to create a setup where the tubes are broad enough inside each grain. So they're basically fine-tuning the arrangement of those grains to make sure that broadness condition holds at every level. Precisely. And that's super important because it lets them use assertions D and E effectively at every step of that inductive argument. It's like they're building the scaffolding for their proof. Okay, so those moves aren't just some random tricks. They're carefully designed to work together with assertions D and E to make that whole inductive process possible. Exactly. It's a beautiful example of how different mathematical ideas can work together to solve a problem, but the ingenuity of this paper doesn't stop there. Remember tube doubling? Oh yeah, that one sounded pretty interesting. Kind of like a side quest in the middle of this epic proof. It might seem like a detour, but it actually reveals something really cool about the connections between different mathematical ideas. What they did was prove a result about the volume of the union of doubled tubes, Basically, the original tubes, but twice as thick. Hmm. Why would they do that? What's amazing is that this seemingly unrelated result actually has implications for a conjecture about the relative size of lines and line segments. It's like finding a secret passage that connects two different rooms in a giant mansion. So by studying these double tubes, they're gaining insights into something completely different. That's the beauty of math. Sometimes seemingly unrelated ideas turn out to be connected in surprising ways. And this tube doubling result adds another layer of depth to this already groundbreaking paper. Okay, I'm starting to feel like we're really getting deep into the weeds here. We've got assertions, grains, moves, tube doubling, and I bet there's even more hiding in this paper. You're not wrong. There's definitely more we could dive into, but I think he's covered the core concepts of this proof. Well, then maybe a time to zoom back out and look at the big picture again. We've spent a lot of time taking this proof apart, but what does it all actually mean? Not just for mathematicians, but for everyone else. That's a great question, and that's what we're going to explore in the final part of our deep dive. Get ready to discover how this seemingly abstract proof could have implications far beyond the realm of pure mathematics. All right, so we've made it to the top of this mathematical mountain. We've explored those tiny grains, learned all about those strategic moves, and even doubled some tubes. But now I'm kind of curious about the view from up here. What does this proof actually mean for the world? Not just for, like mathematicians in their ivory towers, but for the rest of us. That's the exciting part. This isn't just some abstract puzzle that mathematicians are obsessed with. The Kakea conjecture has some really deep connections to other areas of math, and now that they've solved it, who knows what kind of ripple effects it'll have. So it's like solving one piece of a much larger puzzle, and that opens up new possibilities for research in other areas. Exactly. Remember how we talked about the connection to signal processing? Yeah, that was pretty mind-blowing. Well, in a very abstract sense, the Kakea problem kind of relates to how efficiently we can represent information. Think about compressing images or audio files. That's all about finding clever ways to pack information in without losing any quality. Oh, interesting. So this proof could potentially lead to better compression algorithms, smaller file sizes, 
faster downloads? It, it's definitely possible. The techniques they develop to analyze those non-clustering tubes, those might give us new ways to think about representing information more efficiently. That would be amazing. But are there any other potential applications besides that? Oh, absolutely. The Kakea conjecture, it has connections to all sorts of fields like harmonic analysis, number theory, even theoretical computer science. It's like this mathematical crossroads where all these different paths intersect and kind of feed off each other. Wow, so it's like a key that can unlock doors in all these different areas. That's a great way to put it. It's still early days, of course, but mathematicians are already buzzing about all the potential implications of this proof. It's like someone opened up a window and a fresh breeze is blowing through the whole mathematical landscape. I have to admit, even though I don't understand all the nitty-gritty details, I'm getting caught up in all the excitement. It's just amazing how human ingenuity can crack these problems that seem impossible. Yeah, it really shows the power of human curiosity and our desire to understand the world around us. Absolutely. Well, I think this is the perfect place to wrap up our deep dive. We've gone from those tiny little grains to some seriously grand implications. And honestly, I feel like I've learned more about math in the past hour than I ever did in school. It's been a pleasure diving into this with you. It's been fantastic. And a huge thanks to expert speaker for guiding us through this incredibly fascinating world and to all of you listening out there we'll leave you with one final thought what other mathematical mysteries are still out there just waiting to be uncovered what hidden connections are waiting for someone to find them keep those brains buzzing and until next time keep on diving deep